thought for a very long time about how to start this message. Humor, wit, something very deep, I'm sure, but nothing came to mind. I think it's one of those topics that we avoid, and we don't want to talk about it because it makes us feel uncomfortable. Families refuse to have this difficult conversation. What happens if? And we really just don't even want to think about it. And yet, here we are. And our community has seen so many tragic deaths recently, deaths of children and young adults. And we haven't talked about it. But this is church, right? And we're a family about to have a difficult conversation. So I'd ask now that you'd pray with me and that we would invite our Father to be a part of our discussion. Lord God, I pray that you would make your presence felt here today, that you would use my words to communicate your message, and that we would each receive what you have prepared for us. Amen. Ben Franklin said, In this world, nothing is certain but death and taxes. And we all know that the mortality rate is 100% right? Death is inevitable, but let's face it, there are good ways and tragic ways in which people pass. I was 18 when my grandmother died. She had a brain tumor, but she died surrounded by her family in her own home. We took care of her, held her hands, sang to her, And when she was in pain, we comforted her. This, this is how death should be. My grandmother was in her 70s, and she lived a full life. She had five kids, a great husband. She just lived. You knew she had a great life. And she knew that she was dying. So there was a sense of peace about that. Now, don't misunderstand or get me wrong. Um, I miss my grandmother every single day. Because she was the best woman I knew. The best. She was kind and gentle and loving, and she just was just the greatest, you know? So I don't think that I'll ever stop missing her. But her death showed me that death can be a positive experience. I mean, she was home with her family, right with her. And so I hope that someday, this is how I'll go, surrounded by the people who love me the most, ushered into the next life by those who've cared for me in this life. Cancer. Car accidents. Suicide. Murder. These are tragedies. And I can stand up here, and I can tell you just how death should be, and we know it's not always like that. And where is God in those situations? Why does God let those things happen? Why doesn't God intervene? What kind of God is that? And I don't have all the answers. I probably don't even have most of them. But what I know, what I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is that God never abandons us when we need him. The God I know and serve is a God of compassion. Does God cause these things to happen? I don't think so. I don't know God to be the puppet master in the sky, you know, controlling everything, watching with amusement while we scatter and hurt. The God I know weeps with us. The God I know is sad when we are sad and hurts when we hurt. John, chapter 11, talks about Jesus' friend Lazarus. Lazarus gets sick and dies. We don't know how Lazarus dies. The Bible doesn't really tell us how he dies. But we know that Lazarus dies, okay? And Jesus knows that Lazarus has died. 
It says so. Earlier in the passage, we didn't read the whole story. But you can go back and you can read the whole story of Lazarus and John. And, and the Bible tells us that Jesus knows. So this is where we find the verse, Jesus wept. Um, John eleven thirty five. If we examine the passage a little bit closer, we can see that Jesus is not upset about Lazarus' death. Jesus knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Go back. Read your Bible. It says it. It says Jesus knows. So I don't think he's upset that Lazarus is dead. Okay? He waits four days before he gets there. Four. And that's a whole other story. You know, so we're not going to talk about, oh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We're not going to talk about that. But I want to focus on... Um, Verses 11, or chapter 11, 33 to 35. And we see that Jesus is not upset about Lazarus' death. He's weeping with Lazarus' friends and family. John 11, 33 to 35 says, When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Now, I'm not like a King James kind of girl most of the time, but I really love the King James version of this passage. There is something about that groaning in the spirit that really speaks to me. Um, newer translations use the words angry and indignant in place of that term, groaning in the spirit. There's something about it. So going back and looking at the origin of the word and doing just a little bit of a word study, we can see that the word groan implies violent agitation. And in this instance, it's caused by grief, not anger. It's an internal groaning of the spirit. Jesus is so moved that his spirit groans. And I said before, Jesus is not moved by his friend's death. Sure, I think he's sad. Okay, but that's not it. He is weeping with, G with Lazarus' friends and family who are weeping, who are sad. His spirit is so moved by their sadness that he groans in the spirit. I don't know, there's something. Jesus knows he's going to raise Lazarus. He says it. So that, that is the God I know. Jesus weeps with us. Death is scary. It is. It's unknown. Even if we hear stories from people who have come back from the dead, who claim to have been to the afterlife, we don't know much about what comes next. And even if someone comes back and they really have a true experience, if they told us all about it, it would still be a little bit scary. It's still scary. Because we've never been there. We've never experienced it for ourselves. So, think of it this way, all right? Let's say, somehow, somehow in your mind, wrap around there, we could communicate with a baby still in the womb. Somehow the baby could understand us and we could talk back and forth, okay? Somehow, make it work. Um, let's name our baby. How about Sarah? Sure. Our baby's name is Sarah. How do we tell Sarah what it will be like to take her first breath? She's never breathed before. How do we explain what it's like to be able to really, like, stretch and move and have all this space? She's been cramped in the womb for more than nine months. She's pretty cozy, all right? <laughs> How do you explain what it will be like to be cold or hungry? She's never been cold or hungry before. So she's cozy and warm and never breathed. And, you know, and how do you explain the birthing process itself? We've all been born, okay? But it's got to be terrifying. Terrifying! Babies come out crying, after all. So, you know, all the pressure and squeezing that's happening? Uh, yeah, that's a little bit scary. So being born is a pretty scary thing. And yet, we've all been born, and we could try our best to explain to Sarah what everything will be like in this world. But the baby, Sarah, she has no frame of reference. 
She has nothing to compare it to. She's only known her one life. So death is a birth of sorts. It's a transition from one world into the next. And just like how birth is messy, as many of you know, right? Death can be pretty messy too. Our hope lies in knowing that there is someone there to care for us. There is someone we can trust to catch us, so to speak. God is with us when we're born. God is with us during our lives here on earth right now. And God will be with us during our next life with God. And I don't know what that looks like. I have no idea. I don't know. But I know that God is there. And I know that God will never abandon or forsake us. Okay, fine. Erica, you've made your point. But I'm still here. And I'm missing my friend. I'm missing my family member. What am I supposed to do now? I'm so, so angry with God. I feel sad and let down. Or I'm hurt and confused. And I want you to know it's okay to feel any, of all, any and all of those things. It's all okay. During a sermon, um, Dave Masland, he preached one time when I was a youth. He's our district superintendent. And he said, it's okay to be angry with God. God can handle your anger. I'm going to say it again because it's really good. Dave Mazin, he said this in his sermon. He said, it's okay to be angry with God because God can handle your anger. I cannot tell you how freeing that was for me to hear that because no one had ever said it before. No one had ever told me that was okay. Never. So God can handle your emotions, whatever they may be. God can handle them. The key here is not turning away from God, rather turning toward God, letting God come in. So let's take a look at Job just for a minute. This guy. All right, I'm telling you, he loses everything. Everything in one fell swoop. In the first chapter, Job loses his land, his livestock, and all of his children. In the first chapter. Okay, he loses just everything. And he is a good, faithful man. What, this is what the Bible tells us, that Job is a good guy. You know, he's faithful. Later on, he gets the creeping crud, as we call it, technical terms. Um, and he never turns away from God. He is angry with God. And he questions God. In fact, Job says to God, God, take the day I was born and just take it right off the calendar. Remove it. Because it's not doing me any good. Just remove it. I wish I had never been born. That's how angry Job is with God. But he never curses God. He never turns his back on God. His wife, she's a prize, she tells him, curse God and die. Just be done with it, all right? Because it'd be better than this. Just be done. Curse God and die. Here are good, good, God-fearing Jewish people. And the Bible tells us that they are living faithfully. They are doing what the Torah teaches. They're following the law. And tragedy strikes anyway. Tragedy strikes. Bad things happen to good people. And even though his friends and family tell him to curse God and get it over with, Job praises God. He is angry as all get out. But he praises God, not for taking his family and everything else away from him. He's not praising God for that. He's just praising God because God is good, and God doesn't leave him, and God is with him. So don't, don't misunderstand. He's not praising God. Thanks for taking my kids away. That's not it. He's pretty upset about that. That's a hard place to get to. Praising God, even in our tragedy. Praising God even as we question and hurt. Because the Bible never tells us that Job stops hurting. Job hurts. 
But even while he is in agonizing pain, spiritually, physically, mentally, all of it, he's in agonizing pain, Job praises God. Sometimes life isn't fair. Sometimes bad things happen and we can't control it. And making a good decision does not always mean you'll get a good result. Sometimes there are car accidents, and the people we love can be hurt or even killed. Sometimes someone we love gets cancer. It's just not fair. It's not fair. And in those moments, there are no words. There is nothing you can say to a grieving mother that will bring back her child. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry because some of you have been there, and some of you might be there right now. I'm so sorry you're hurting. I won't tell you that God will take away your pain, because sometimes God doesn't take away your pain. But God will never leave you alone in your pain, and I do know that. Because God is good, and God never, ever leaves us. God is good, and God never, ever leaves us. There's a tradition in the Jewish faith called sitting shiva, And it's when someone dies, and friends and family come over, and they literally just sit with the loved one. They just sit. They don't talk unless the loved one wants to talk. It's just about being there and letting that person know they're not alone. They just sit. Rob Bell, who is a pastor and a speaker, and he's done all sorts of NUMA videos and everything else. Some of you might know who he is. He says, God sits Shiva with us. So when we hurt, God sits Shiva with us. And sometimes there are no words. But that is the God I know. A God who is preparing the way for us, who holds our hands as we transition from this world into the next in whatever way that may happen for us. However it happens, God is leading the way and holding our hands. A God who is waiting to catch us and to comfort those we leave behind. From life's first cry to final breath.